Hello, I'm Jan Carabello and welcome to our Women's History Month special right here on CBS News Philadelphia, celebrating the extraordinary achievements and contributions of women from past to present. Over the next hour, we are shining a light on the stories of remarkable women who have shaped our future and empowered our communities. Let's get started. We are highlighting a trailblazer who owns several McDonald's franchises. That's right. CBS News Philadelphia's Wakisha Bailey shares how she went from crew member to corporate executive and now to proprietor of every McDonald's along the main line. Very nice. You doing okay, babe? I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to be here. Hey, John, come here for one second, please. I was called probably every name but my name. Keep smiling. I just put my head down and keep on working. She's defied the odds and made quite a name for herself. McDonald's franchise owner, Tanya Hill Holiday. The complaints just came because of who I were. All the good, bad, and great things. Just over five feet tall, she may be small in stature, but her fight and dreams were always big. You're in my very first McDonald's that I purchased in 2005, and that is the Rosemont McDonald's right next to Villanova University. The Rosemont McDonald's is now one out of her dozen locations. Born in Virginia, but raised in West Philadelphia, Holiday attended Morgan State University, where she landed her first job. Two story, picked up the yellow pages. At that time, we had yellow pages. Right. <laughs> and start flipping through and I saw this, the McDonald's okay. called on the phone and I said, are you hiring? Do a bus get there. She started as a crew member at McDonald's in Baltimore, Maryland. I always enjoyed what I was doing. Right. And as difficult and frustrating as it was to be told, hey, you gotta clean the tables, you gotta clean the toilets, you gotta scrub the baseboards, you gotta do, I did it. <laughs> I've been in the McDonald's system now for, 44 years. Holiday has worked 13 positions, including vice president, and then the opportunity presented itself to own a franchise that now goes for close to $1.5 million. I was fortunate enough to take my stock options and um, purchase my first McDonald's restaurant. That was her start. I own 12 McDonald's today. She oversees more than 600 employees, some who have been with Her team, who she considers family, runs the day-to-day -day operations. Holiday makes it a mission to also give back. Because I serve as the National Black McDonald's Own Operator Chair and CEO of 168 entities across the U.S. She hopes her journey inspires young people working their first job. Stay motivated, stay encouraged, stay prayed up. I stay prayed up all the time. <laughs> Holiday's success is truly because of the heart and hustle in the Golden Arches so many of us call home. Wakisha Bailey, CBS News, Philadelphia. Women, they are breaking barriers in industries often dominated by men. That includes the brewing industry. Our area is home to a number of women-owned breweries. And this week, I went to check out Triple Bottom Brewing in Philadelphia's popular neighborhood. Even though it is a male-dominated industry, it is a place where there are so many people who really want to be inclusive to people of every background and all genders. Tess Hart is the co-owner of Triple Bottom Brewing, located at 9th and Spring Garden Streets in Philadelphia. They opened their doors in 2019, just a few months before the pandemic. My background is actually more in the community and economic development space, and then I was a brewery lover from the outside of the industry. And as I was falling in love with breweries and with craft beer, I realized just how vibrant these community spaces are. You could have, you know, made a rec center you know, right. to bring the community Great together. Question. So what, what, what was it about beer and, and the brewing business? I think there's a lot of joy in breweries. I think there's a lot of joy and connection. Beer really brings people together and it felt just like such a beautiful and fertile space to, to grow from. And they grew from humble beginnings. This picture is from 2018 before the build out began. Hart and her business partners did some of the construction themselves, but her love for brewing and breweries started in 2016. That's when she went to a brewer's convention. Back then I was just like bright eyed and had this idea, but I hadn't proven that I could do it yet. And I remember walking the floor of the sort of expo space and getting a lot of like, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? And it's 
It was pretty demoralizing. But she pushed forward with her idea and established a brewery focusing on beer, people, and the planet. Her staff is majority women, and she calls the business fair chance, meaning they hire people who are impacted by the justice system or are housing insecure. There's definitely change coming, and I think you often hear that line, like you can't be what you can't see, and so the more of us who are doing it, I think opens up space for other folks of all genders to, to take a step into this too. And Hart went on to say, for other women looking to break into male-dominated fields to believe in yourself and find allies. She also says that she would be happy to talk to any woman who's looking to break into the brewing industry. It really looks like a nice space. It really is a nice space. Very Not nice. far from here either. Very nice. Jane Lipton owned Fat Lady Brewing in 2021. It's one of the few women-owned businesses like this in the Delaware Valley. Now, this brewery is on Main Street in Manioc, and Jane told our Howard Monroe that the business has a circus theme to let people know that everyone is welcome. You know, we tend to think of, of, of beer as being a man's drink and a sports-related drink, right? We tend to think of it that way. Come into Fat Lady Brewing, half our clientele are women. Groups of women love coming to Fat Lady Brewing because our tables aren't right up on each other. There's room, it's friendly, it's open. The overall concept is a circus theme, which takes us to our goal of being a community bar. In the old days, the circus was a community. People made it their family, everybody fit in. You found a niche and you could be there for life in a group of people that were open-minded and thought just like you thought embraced you. Well, the brewery has events every night of the week and recently teamed up with Second Helping Barbecue to offer food as well. It's a great pairing there. This Women's History Month, we're also shining the spotlight on savvy business owners. The CBS Philadelphia's Aziza Schuler introduces you to a female chef serving up some New York flavor at the Fashion District Mall in Center City. You're bringing a taste of New York to Philadelphia. Philadelphia. That's right, and everybody loves it. Everyone loves it. Everyone loves it. After all, what's not to love about one of New York's most traditional street foods, a hot dog? And at Dawn Demery's restaurant, the Little Hot Dog Wagon at the Fashion District Mall, she's serving up beef and vegan links straight off the grill, topped with her famous homemade all-natural kraut. It's a topping, it's a side dish, it's an appetizer, it's a marinade. As you'd imagine from the name, the Little Hot Dog Wagon started as just that, a wagon. Demery says after being laid off from from her job in 2018, she began paddling the pavement with her hot dog cart in New York City, popping up on college campuses, street fairs, and her most prominent location on 123rd Street and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. Blowing up from this corner because this is how it started. It was her customers who encouraged her to open a restaurant. Listen to my community, my Harlem community. Girl, Dawn, you need to have a restaurant, you know, you need to expand. So I listened. And she brought her beloved recipes to Philly. Kendra James, marketing manager of the Fashion District Mall, says the Little Hot Dog Wagon is currently the only black woman-owned restaurant in Center City. She's really making a statement, and I think it's going to be a launching pad for other people to see that they can also establish businesses here in Center City, which is like a really thriving part of the city. People are saying, Dawn, you, in, you inspire me, you inspire me, you inspire me. And ironically, it's a lot of women. Dimry is indeed an inspiration. She's a mother, a breast cancer survivor, and a successful entrepreneur. I just go for it. You know, I don't let anything stop me. I say no to nothing. I feel like there's nothing I can't do. In Center City, Aziza Schuler, CBS News, Philadelphia. New Jersey is celebrating the signing of a doula access bill, ensuring that all mothers have a right to a doula for emotional and physical support in a hospital or a birthing center. Waukesha Bailey joins us with why a local nonprofit says the new law is sparking some very important conversations. Just by myself, 60. 60 babies. Doula and doula supervisor Sylvia Corrado of Children's Home Society of New Jersey has been assisting mothers throughout their pregnancies. This is her baby, so it's our baby. We're Sydney's <laughs> baby. Two-year-old Isabella is a big girl now, but her mother Stephanie says she was fortunate to have Sylvia by her side during her pregnancy. My husband, he doesn't really understand that much English, so he felt safer 
right. having her there. Like many of the mothers here inside Children's Home Society, this nonprofit provides family support services to our most vulnerable populations. And at the top of their list is now a bilingual doula training program funded partly by the Burke Foundation. They speak the same language. They have the same, some of the same cultural practices. The Burke Foundation invested around $500,000 to the first bilingual doula program here in Trenton. So they can hire even more doulas that are Hispanic, that are black, that are Arabic, Middle Eastern, that really matches the rich diversity of this community. Doula trainer Carla Graves spent several weeks and sometimes months with individuals until they received their doula certification. Doulas don't just provide care during your pregnancy and during your labor. They provide care after your labor, too. They help with breastfeeding. Um, they help uh, with, uh, you know, WIC appointments. And these trainees are eager to start. Not nervous at all about it. I'm excited. Many women come into this country who doesn't speak English, who doesn't have a family here. They need support. My first client will be my daughter. Who's nine months pregnant. I feel mm -hmm. like I have everything that I need and more. <laughs> Are you nervous at all? To give birth? Yeah. No, I was meant to do this. Well, Keisha Bailey, CBS News, Philadelphia. Imagine going to college when you're just 13 and then becoming a specialized surgeon here in Philadelphia. Wow. Health reporter Stephanie Stahl has the story of a groundbreaking doctor as we celebrate Women's History Month. Yes, she is wow. very special, that's for sure. Talk about making history. This spine surgeon at Temple Health has been way ahead of the curve for decades, and she's not even 40 yet. I am the first and only female spine surgeon ever at Temple University Hospital. For 38-year-old Dr. Teresa Pazionis, being a trailblazer started when she was young. I was able to take university courses in my second year of high school, which is when I graduated. She sailed through advanced courses in high school and zipped right into college when she was how young? I started high school at 12 and I started college at 13. You're obviously a super brain. A lot of people are, but yes. <laughs> so They kind of identified at that point that I was gifted. Um, a lot of people are gifted in different ways. She took that intellectual gift into medicine, where she settled into orthopedics and then specialized in spinal oncology, where the technology is becoming very high tech. When we say hindsight is 2020, we're actually developing that hindsight now, such as performing spinal deformity corrections with personalized implants and some of the robotics and AI technology that we're bringing to Temple, or building the uh, orthopedic oncology program so that we can provide the best orthopedic oncology care to the North Philadelphia community. It's performing surgeries that give patients both longevity as well as their function back. And while she's devoted to medicine, she has other interests. What do you do for fun? A lot. I go to the gym a lot. Travel. I cook. Um, I have a lot of friends in the culinary industry. Having accomplished so much so young, what's the future hold? I'm actually working on a five-year and a ten-year career plan. Of course she is, right? <laughs> now, Dr. Pazziona says the future of orthopedic oncology looks very promising with evolution of technology advancing and allowing doctors to perform even better customized surgery. The box office smash Barbie took the world by storm as it celebrated women and showcased the diverse history of the popular doll. This Women's History Month, Elise Preston is introducing you to one incredible woman who made her mark in history as the designer of Mattel's first black Barbie. A big curly fro, bold gold jewelry, and a bright red dress looks dynamite on this brown skin Barbie. Everything that Barbie was, I wanted black Barbie to be the opposite. Kitty Black Perkins, now 76, designed Mattel's first black Barbie, which debuted in 1980 after calls from doll collectors. They were asking for more, more black dolls. In the 60s and 70s, the only diverse dolls in Barbie's world were sidekicks. She's a little bit shapelier. But this doll, made more in the image of black women, would bear the marquee name. I wanted her also to be able to do the same things that the white doll did, yeah. but just add a little bit more spice. Just a dash. Just a dash. Perkins, Mattel's first black designer, grew up in the Jim Crow South. Did you have any black dolls growing up? I did not. And I would actually color the skin of the paper dolls. Why? Because I wanted them to look like me. Kansas mom Sonia Larson collects black Barbies. People don't understand 
that being able to see yourself in a doll is it's everything. Perkins retired from Mattel as chief Barbie designer. Today, Barbie is more inclusive than ever and taking over Hollywood. But for Perkins, Black Barbie was the mold to break the mold. Elise Preston, CBS News, Los Angeles. Business of beauty is a multi-billion dollar industry and while beauty marketing campaigns show faces all, all hues, when it comes to who is actually developing and creating those beauty products, some say there's still a lot of work to be done. CBS correspondent Danya Backus introduces us to a scientist working to make the beauty industry more inclusive. 24-year-old chemist AJ Aday brings science to beauty. This is zinc oxide, so this is responsible for what absorbs the UV light in your sunscreens. AJ is earning her PhD in teaching at UCLA. She wants to draw more scientists of color into the research and development segment of the beauty industry. So you'll be surprised to actually understand that the SPF value on a bottle is tested from people with lighter skin tones. As a student and researcher, AJ, whose parents immigrated from Ghana, saw what she calls an inclusivity gap. People of color were being left out of research and testing for beauty products. To fix that, in 2021, she founded Sula Labs. When there's not a lot of people that are able to really help you understand the efficacy of these products from a whole spectrum of skin tones, that becomes a problem. Brands come to Sula Labs and the eight member team helps formulate and test products specifically for darker skin. The company is currently working with at least 20 brands. If it's a brand that focuses on, you know, darker skin tones or has a has a black founder, we may have touched it. Rihanna broke down barriers in 2017 when she launched her Fenty Beauty line. You could be the scientific counterpart to Rihanna Fenty. I think what she did for the beauty industry is wild because all she did was help give shades to people that look like me. So I think the scientific counterpart to Rihanna is effectively what we're also trying to do too. AJ also hopes to be a game changer, using science to show black women they have value and a voice in the beauty industry. Danya Backus, CBS News, Los Angeles. As we celebrate Women's History Month, we introduce you now to a plumber who's breaking the barriers for women in skilled trades. Delaware County reporter Madeline Wright had a chance to meet the woman known as the Tiny Plumber Girl. Kelly Ireland from Ridley Park is cutting through gender norms in the plumbing industry. I would go on a job site and people would look at me like, oh, that's who we're working with. Now I walk into a house and people are like, I want to hire you. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, last year only 2.2% of plumbers, steam fitters, and pipe fitters were women. While Ireland stands out in her profession, she doesn't skip a beat. She rose from apprentice to master plumber. She's now the owner of TPG Mechanical. TPG stands for Tiny Plumber Girl, which is the name that I got um, working in commercial construction. I gotta get a wrap around. With a stature of four foot 11 inches, she may be small, but she's doing big jobs. Like rebuilding the bathroom drainage at this house in Lansdowne. Great and drops down. drops down. Before becoming a business owner, Ireland spent eight years in commercial construction where she faced male attitudes and prejudices. She was often the only female plumber on the job. Issues that I dealt with just being a female is men talking to me inappropriately. Despite the challenges, she remained focused, something she ingrains in others. If like I can empower women to find that passion and like want to do a good job, then it just motivates the next generation to reach that potential. She's inspiring other women like Casey Wilbanks to join the trades. Well, I'm so thankful that Kelly has been a really instrumental part of my journey. Ireland encourages women to pursue their passions when it comes to turning a pipe dream into reality. In Lansdowne, Delaware County, Madeline Wright, CBS News, Philadelphia. A woman making Latin American comfort food is breaking barriers at a farmer's market in Wayne. It is, of course, Women's History Month, and CBS News Philadelphia reporter Marcella Bayado shares how this woman is spreading her love for empanadas while representing her culture. 
These golden brown empanadas infused with an array of sweet and savory fillings have become much more than just a crispy handheld staple at the Lancaster County Farmers Market. I usually call them pockets of love. Veronica Fitzgerald first started making the fried on the go meals for her friends and family in 2009 as a way to tap into her Ecuadorian culture after moving to the U.S. at 14 with her family. And I just decided to teach myself how to make some of the things that brought me back to when I was young and my traditions. Fast forward and V Empanadas was born. We're making about 3,000 of them a month is a lot. All those empanadas have led her to become the first Latina-owned business to have a stand at the market since it started back in 1929. We have a lot of people um, around here that work and support this market that are Latin, but to actually have the spot and to offer Latin fare to, um, to people here is amazing. She's also offering other Latin small businesses a chance to showcase their own products at her stand, too. Take care. To prepare for orders, Fitzgerald first gets the dough ready, scoops in the desired filling, and uses a mold to close up the empanada before it's fried up and ready for a taste test. That's like the first one I, um, I started making. That, that was my first one ever. She can now hand make 65 of them in just an hour. But juggling a successful business and a family wouldn't have been possible without support from those around her, like her father, who helps out at the market. When she needs, I have to be here. She hopes to inspire others to take on new opportunities and always lean on the ones. I'm very lucky. <laughs> and the food that bring you comfort. In Wayne, Marcella Bayetto, CBS News, Philadelphia. Judge Tamika Lane now sits on one of the highest state courts in Pennsylvania, but her road to the bench has not been easy. Well, we sat down with a Philadelphia native just ahead of International Women's Judges Day this weekend to talk about her inspiring journey to Superior Court and her message to other women who want to pursue a life in public service. I'm just really blessed to be a Philly girl sitting on this wonderful court that's been around since the 1800s. Judge Tamika Lane is fresh off her swearing in ceremony in January, where she became one of 14 Pennsylvania Superior Court judges, only the second African-American woman on the court. It has definitely been a journey. A journey after graduating from Howard University that started out in a classroom as a public school teacher in Maryland, then on the road to law school. Growing up, I didn't want to be a lawyer. It wasn't even on my radar. It wasn't until I participated in a program for inner city youth that I was exposed to law. The West Philadelphia native went on to embrace the law, eventually dedicating her life to public service. I was a public defender. I was a child advocate. I represented abused and neglected children. I worked in the state Senate with Senator Anthony Williams before I got elected to the Court of Common Pleas in 2013. My name is Judge Tamika Lane, and I am running for Pennsylvania Superior Court. The road to the state Superior Court led her campaign through the Commonwealth, traversing its 67 counties, a state as diverse and varied as its landscape and terrain. Judge Lane admits it wasn't easy breaking barriers. People told me to change my name. They said, you'll never win as Tamika. You have to be Tammy. They told me that, you know, I was too dark, I was too short, I really should have blonde hair, my body should look differently. The mother, cancer survivor and longtime attorney and judge was only fueled by the naysayers, the disbelievers, making her victory in 2023 all the more relished. Part of it, again, is staying true to who you are and being authentically you. And that's why I'm so grateful to be here as Tamika Lane, you know, from the bottom and setting that example that we don't have to change who we are to suit someone else's vision. Judge Lane's 10 year term on the Pennsylvania Superior Court is just beginning. This is a wall of judges here. And that is our president, Judge Ann Lazarus. Her picture will soon grace these walls as she blazes her own history making trail. The first public school teacher here, the first person who was a public defender elected to this court. So that's already bringing different voices and different lived experiences. Advice she would give other women thinking about entering public service. Women have to be asked multiple times before we say yes to run for office. And I want to say, say yes immediately. You know, you believe in yourself, believe in your dreams. They were put into you for a reason. And don't doubt yourself. You can do it. 
We're honoring the contributions of American women during World War II, also known as the Rosies. But who are the real Rosies? Anchor Jan Caraveo goes beyond the iconic image and introduces us to one of the original Rosies living right here in the Delaware Valley. It's clear the person who lives at this home in Levittown, Bucks County, loves Rosie the Riveter. Well, for me, I was, I was excited. That is May Cryer, not just any enthusiast. Cryer is one of the original Rosies. I was a tomboy at the time, and I loved it. I mean, just was great. The year was 1943. At 17, Cryer had just moved to Seattle with her sister and friend, intent on landing a job to help her country during World War II. It turned out we all ended up being Rosie Riveters through the war. Rosie's making planes for Boeing. They take you downtown and they put a piece of sheet metal in a vise, and they teach you how to drill holes and how to rivet and how to buck. And then two weeks later, here you are, they take you right into the fact where you're working on the huge, huge bombers. Including this B-17. The photo, freezing a moment in time, celebrating Cryer and all the other workers who made it possible. That was the 5,000 that we'd made since Pearl Harbor. And so they let us all paint our names on it. We realized how important our job was. After all, Cryer and the Rosies, who would become immortalized as Rosie the Riveter, were trailblazers. Women entering the workforce in unprecedented numbers and filling roles previously held by men. It wasn't men's world anymore. I mean, women showed how capable they were. People come up to me and say, you women opened the doors for us. And now, Cryer wants to make sure no one forgets. I just knew that the women should be recognized. The men got all the credit after the war and they couldn't have done it without us. Through countless appearances and advocacy, Cryer helped establish Rosie the Riveter Day, observed on March 21st, her birthday. She also spearheaded the effort that led to Rosie's being awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Not even a pandemic slowed her down. I said I just turned in my rivet gun for a sewing machine. She made 6,000 Rosie-inspired masks. One of them even reached space. A polka-dotted mask and bandana rocketed to the International Space Station. And that was such a thrill. And a full circle moment, as this Rosie reflects on how far she's come. I never in my lifetime think I'd you know, go that far. Jan Carabello, CBS News, Philadelphia. We introduce you to a Camden County woman and World War II veteran. She has spent most of her life making sure that female veterans are represented and recognized. According to the National World War II Museum, about 350,000 women served during the war. That's roughly 2% of all who served. And as New Jersey reporter Ryan Hughes explains, her fight is far from over. I uh, talk a lot. <laughs> May the 13th, I'm going to be 100 years old. Her motto is one day at a time, and her continued fight for recognition begins every morning by putting on her hat. I feel as though I have a job to do. May Brill is a proud World War II veteran. A wall of awards covers her living room wall, detailing the different times in her life. Is this you? Yes. She's been honored by New Jersey and federal lawmakers. And in January, May was one of 12 people to receive the Camden County Freedom Medal. She's made it her mission to inform the world that women in the military are not invisible. I don't like to wear hats, but I wear this hat every day. And when I go out, people they are surprised. The words World War II female veteran are embroidered on the side. Both her brothers served during the war, and at 20 years old, May enlisted with the Waves, a branch of the Naval Reserve for women. And I said, what's the matter with me? It's my country, too. May spent two years with the Waves. She worked hand in hand with the men, but says women never received any credit. You would go a play to a place where you were with a man who was a veteran, and they would talk to the man as the veteran, not to the woman. They made for me. So decades later, May says she's still making sure female veterans are seen and heard. And at 99 years old, she's still on the move. May 
Louise spends many days at the Cats Jewish Community Center in Cherry Hill, where she's volunteered for years and spoken to groups about the history of women in the military. Her picture is front and center on the wall. A young girl who is very proud to be in the military. May and her husband had four daughters, and they say she's an inspiration. She, along with my father, has taught us all our life that women can do anything, and she is the example of women can do anything. May still serves as the chairwoman of women in the military for the state of New Jersey and commander of Jewish War Veterans Post 126. We want people to realize that women are as good as the men. We love working beside them, but we want recognition. For now, she says she's not ready to stop wearing her hat. In Cherry Hill, Ryan Hughes, CBS News, Philadelphia. Cheers for an all-women flight crew as they landed in Newark. United Airlines Flight 1215 arrived from Sarasota in the cockpit. Captain Gabrielle Harding, who is only the second black woman in United's history to become a line check pilot, which is someone who trains other pilots, new pilots. This was the first flight with United Airlines for First Officer Julia Olioff, who moved to the flight deck after working as a flight attendant. I've been nothing but blessed to have this amazing experience of so, so much support from everybody. So for me, this marks a great occasion because I became a line check pilot so that people like Julia didn't have to run into the obstacles that I ran into. Well, the flight had four female flight attendants, making it a six-woman crew flying together. Female firefighters showed off their skills in debt for the fire department, hosted a Women's History Month celebration at the Blackwood Terrace Fire Company. Firefighters performed drills that help protect the community and save lives. The department says they are always looking for more volunteer firefighters. We're introducing you to an Olympic archery coach who's working to get more women and girls into the sport. CBS News Philadelphia, Delaware County reporter Madeline Wright has the story from Middletown. Cindy Bevilacqua is a trailblazer in a sport dominated by men. The Delaware County native has won many awards over the last four decades. But the highlight of her career was coaching the American team at the 2012 Summer Olympics in London. It was really amazing. I wish there were more female coaches at the higher level. That's why she's made it her mission to encourage women and girls to get involved with archery. Go ahead. And female participation is going up. It's growing a lot since a lot of the um, TV with the Hunger Games and then the Olympics and then Brave. Her journey with archery began when she was five years old. She became an elite athlete. Now she's the president of the Middletown Archery Club. This is a glimpse of Bevel Aqua leading a session of elite archers. Run your mental game, go. As head coach, she's introduced thousands to the sport, including 17-year-old Anna Helmig, who uses a wheelchair. It's hard to get over that hump of like, oh, I can't do it. But the most rewarding part is when you realize that you can do it. Is that better? Yeah. She's one of many girls who look up to Bevilacqua as a role model. We'll see you in a week. I like working with Sunila. Bevilacqua tells all her students, when it comes to hitting the bullseye, keep your eyes glued to the middle and stay still as a statue when releasing the arrow. No, that was good. Bevilacqua was, takes like pride in seeing more women take to archery. It gives you, you know, cardiovascular fitness. It gives you mind and body and soul with your know, mental, you know, stability. Her advice to others, give it your best shot. Follow your dreams in archery and in life. In Middletown, Delaware County. Madeline Wright, CBS News, Philadelphia. A historic location in Philadelphia. It is celebrating Women's History Month this March. The Betsy Ross House will feature new and interactive programming for visitors. And CBS News Philadelphia reporter Wakisha Bailey tells us more about this. 
Well, thousands of visitors come here to the Betsy Ross House every year, but it's even more special during the month of March as we celebrate Women's History Month. So joining us today is Lisa Mulder, Executive Director of the Betsy Ross House, and thank you for having us. So here we are, Women's History Month. Can you first tell us who is Betsy Ross? Oh, Betsy Ross was a working mom, a patriot, an upholsterer, and of course a flag maker. Now we are here in the Betsy Ross house and this is a very special location. Can you kind of walk us through where we are? Yeah, we are in Betsy Ross's upholstery shop. Um, this is a special and unique place because we are the only working 18th century upholstery shop in the country. So our Betsy Ross um, history makers are in here daily, uh, hand stitching things to furnish the home um, while they're interacting with the public. Now, as you celebrate the month, of March and Women's History Month. What can visitors expect when they come here? Well, I mean, every day is a special day for women at the <laughs> Betsy Ross House. We celebrate women daily with, through our programming, but with Women's History Month, we bring in additional free programming throughout the month. Um, you get to meet women other than Betsy and her daughter, Clarissa, um, on Saturdays through our History Maker, our History Maker Saturday programs. And then on Storytelling Sundays, you get to hear um, award-winning stories from our Once Upon a Nation storytellers, um, highlighting additional stories from women um, who live throughout the history of Philadelphia that you may not have heard of. Um, but this program that we're debuting this weekend is really special. It's called A Crafternoon with uh, Claypool and Wilson. And for $20, you get a tour of the Betsy Ross house, of course, and you get an opportunity to learn sewing from Betsy Ross herself and her daughter, Clarissa. So we get to actually go behind this banister and actually sew with Betsy Ross and Clarissa. Yeah, that is not something we do every day. I mean, you have to be a VIP to go behind <laughs> this barrier. Um, but uh, if you're participating in this program this weekend, uh, you first get to make your sachet with Clarissa. And then when you come in here into the upholstery shop um, and you show Betsy your sachet, she will invite you to go behind the barrier and she will teach you how to make some stitches on a slipcase. Well, how cool is that? I definitely hope that I get VIP here. And of course, we're going to have all that information for you if you'd like to sew with Betsy Ross and Clarissa. Well, Keisha Bailey, CBS News, Philadelphia. The civil rights movement touches every corner of our country, but oftentimes some key figures get left out of the history books. It turns out a pioneer of the movement known as the Greensboro sit-ins came from right here in the Delaware Valley. This Women's History Month, we're talking to one of those heroes. And the year, it was 1960, and for the very first time, Nancy Kirby is telling her story to CBS Philadelphia's Liz Crawford. Nancy Kirby's story begins in Haddonfield, New Jersey, where she grew up and graduated high school at age 16. She was planning to stay local for college. I was going to commute to either Penn or Temple, and I had applied and gotten full tuition scholarships to both. But her mother insisted she go away and attend an HBCU. She wanted me to have an experience where I was not in the minority. Kirby decided on Bennett College, a historically black college for women in Greensboro, North Carolina. It was her first time in the segregated South. And when she arrived there in the late 1950s, the civil rights movement was starting to catch on. Then her senior year in 1960. My mother called and she said, I don't want you getting mixed up in those sit-ins. She said, your grandmother and I have our tickets to come to your graduation. The sit-in demonstrations were pivotal to the civil rights movement when blacks sat down at whites only lunch counters. The first to do it are known as the Greensboro Four, four North Carolina A&T students who took a stand by sitting down at the Woolworth lunch counter. They sparked an evolution and their story has been told by many over the last 60 plus years. There's a statue of the four men on A&T's campus, but there's more to the story. They didn't come up with this idea by themselves at all. <laughs> and, and so um, I got tired of hearing that story um, told the wrong way. And I think that the Bennett women deserve a whole lot more credit than they get. Linda Brown wrote a book to set the record straight. As a Bennett alum herself, she knows firsthand about the planning and organizing that went on behind the scenes before that first sit-in. And this was not just true of Greensboro, but it was true of the whole civil rights movement that women did not get the credit that they should have gotten 
um, in terms of being the movers and shakers of this of this movement. At 20 years old and 450 miles from home, Nancy Kirby was one of those movers and shakers. My mother called again and said, do not get involved in that. By this time, I had already been arrested. But Kirby said the movement was too important. She wasn't scared to be on the front lines. You are privileged to get this education and you have the responsibility to make it better for others. Despite her participation in the sit-ins, Kirby graduated in 1960. That Only in recent been years been has she and other been women been, been recognized for their role in the movement that changed the course of history. Liz Crawford, CBS News, Philadelphia. The Little Freedom Libraries across the city are expanding in honor of Women's History Month. Two previously banned books by women authors will now be added at all 14 locations. These include Front Desk by Kelly Yang and Feminism is for Everybody by Bell Hooks. Barbara Giddings, meantime, she is considered one of the pioneers of LGBT plus rights and women's rights. In the 60s, the activists fought against employment discrimination, picketing outside of Independence Hall. CBS News Philadelphia reporter Josh Sanders goes on a tour which highlights Giddings' impact. If you look at the very top, you can see the two original row homes. Rebecca Fisher enjoys retracing footprints of history where American democracy took its first steps. In 1755 by Benjamin Franklin. And she reminds people of stories that often go untold in the city of brotherly love, leading her and her co-founder to create a series of Beyond the Bell tours. It was on the 4th of July in 1965, and it was called the Annual Reminder. One of those tours is the Badass Women's Tour, a love letter to Philadelphia women like Barbara Giddings. Barbara Giddings, for many in Philadelphia, is the mother of the LGBTQ rights movement because she stages the very first picket protest for LGBTQ rights here in Philadelphia outside of the Liberty Bell on the 4th of July. From 1965 to 1969, Giddings picketed outside Independence Hall against employment discrimination by the federal government towards the LGBTQ plus community. Four years before the New York City Stonewall riots in June of 1969. It is taking place on the 4th of July to remind people that not everybody in America has their civil liberties. It has everybody dressed the way they dress for work because she wants to show how ready for work the queer community is. She was a maverick. Mark Siegel is the founder of Philadelphia Gay News and was at the Stonewall riots, befriending Giddings in 1969. Well, I think she was a very brave woman in you know 1965 through 69, doing those marches outside Independence Hall, just standing up and saying, I'm a lesbian, it was amazing. They were the only 100 out people in all of America. Then Stonewall happens. And throughout that next year, people were organizing. One year later, 15,000 people came out to march. Giddings' activism did not stop outside Independence Hall. Her next piece of activism is the declassification of homosexuality as a mental illness. In 1972, she and a coalition from Philadelphia, including gay psychiatrist John Fryer, traveled to Texas, advocating for the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality as a mental illness. It was removed as a mental disorder the following year. Symptoms that you see in your gay patients are not a result of their sexuality, but how people treat gay people. Barbara Giddings Way now marks the intersection of Locust and 13th Streets in Philadelphia's Gaberhood, and a mural of her annual reminder protest is on the side of the William Way LGBT Community Center. Her legacy is one of equality, beyond the bell that still rings today. Josh Sanders, CBS News, Philadelphia. Thanks for watching our Women's History Month special. Make sure to check out the latest stories at cbsphiladelphia.com slash Women's History Month. And if you're enjoying this show, download our app, CBS Philadelphia, on your smart TV, Apple TV, Roku, or streaming device to catch us every weekend. And keep it right here. There is so much more to come right here on CBS News Philadelphia.